Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Thanks for joining me today. What we're going to do is we're going to sit down and take a look at why a mixing console might be the right choice for your recording studio. To help me out, I've got Rob Russell here. It's great to see you, Rob. Nice to see you, Mitch. We're here in your room. Yeah. Where you do uh, album mixing and production and all kinds of things here. Very beautiful audience console that we're sitting in front of. It's and been great for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, man, your credits go back to Streeterville in Chicago. Yeah. You were in L.A. for years. Brian McKnight, yep. Aaron Neville, and all yeah. the main studios there, uh, major studios there. Yep. So quite a background as an engineer, but also you've been designing, specking, and building studios since the 90s. Yeah, I mean, once everything turned in the 90s and this stuff was affordable for putting in a home like this... Uh, all of my clients wanted me to build them rooms. <laughs> right, right. So that's, it was a great place, a uh, great path to go down. Yeah, yeah, well, we appreciate you taking time and sitting down with us today because I think there are some misconceptions about mixing consoles, you know. Mm -hmm. Many people today have come up mixing with a mouse. Yes. Uh, or maybe with a small control surface, and that's fine, that's great. Yeah. You can certainly make a lot of great music that way. But incorporating a console into what you're doing can really make a difference. It does. It makes a huge difference. And, and I do a lot of the in-the-box stuff as well, especially for other people, and it's just no, there's no comparing it to having a console. It, it brings me back, and there's a lot of advantages. Right. So for those who've never worked on a console, never sat in front of a large console like this, tell us what it is. What's it about? So to me, a large console like this is, it's the centerpiece of the studio, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can control and have access to anything that's going on. So to me, it's all about workflow. And having an inline desk like this one, or like the old Neve VRs or SSLs, those are inline consoles. And the, the flexibility you have at the drop of a, of, of a hat to say, okay, I'm changing directions, or I need to do this, and there's all kinds of different setups that'll help your workflow depending on what you're doing. If you're tracking a large group, single instrument overdubs, mixing, or whatever you're doing, um, the console just works for you. Right, it kind of gives you everything in one place. Absolutely. Now you mentioned this is an inline console and, and uh, we're not specifically covering this console, but sure. what does that mean? What is an inline console? So an inline console is gonna allow you to have one channel, right, that's gonna bring your mic preamp in, mm -hmm. so your, your mics from, from all your instruments, as well as your tape return. Tape return, yeah, your, your DAW return, right? right? <laughs> that goes, that, that dates me. But, <laughs> but uh, now that allows me to have two paths or more on one channel strip. Okay. Again, the flexibility of how you use that and what you do in different situations allows me to work quickly and efficiently and the most important thing is having the musicians have a great headphone mix and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And they're not when you're playing with a mouse and waiting, ah, oh, let me do this, let me change this, let me change this I.O. setup or this or that. No, it's walking in and using this as an instrument. Right. Really. Right. Really. So that's during the tracking stage where mm -hmm. you just have instant access to all the control for your headphone mixes, for your monitor mix, yeah. as well as for gain, level, Absolutely. EQ. All those things are built into that input side of the, the console. Uh -huh. The second part of it is the what's called generally the center section yeah. of the console. And in this console, it's, it's, not, it's, it's what's right over behind you. And that center section is huge, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where I bring everything together. So I've got my monitor selects if I want to listen to different monitors and volume and talk back to the artist. And all the major setup stuff, that's where I have all my bus master levels and everything to really be the control section of this console, right? right? This console happens to have a dual layer where we can get into automation and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the center section, that's key, right? That's Yeah, that's where it all where it yeah. all happens. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Once, once you've got the signals in the console, yeah, yeah. then you've got a way to, uh, to deal with them. So there are kind of two aspects to a, a console in my mind. We've talked a little bit about the workflow aspect, mm -hmm. the, the uh, instant access to the controls, but it's also instant access to more than one control at once. Well, and that's where uh, back in the day having these, everyone goes, says, well, how do you need a 72 or a 60 input console? Well, if you're at a big studio and you got a huge setup going, this is the ultimate in multiple people working on a desk, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why would you do that? Well, you know what? Those big studios, the assistants were the magic that happened in those, right? Because they can walk up and make an adjustment. They may be setting up headphone sends. They may be setting something else where you're working on another specific thing. So mm -hmm. that's the great part. There's some digital consoles out there that allow multi-person workflows. Right. Um, but this is where it started, right? This is, this is where you had 
the experience of being in a studio where you had a producer that he was sitting there working on something and an engineer and an assistant engineer and everyone's working together on that council to really mm -hmm. make the session go in the direction it should for the artist and the producer. Right. So how does that work for you? I know a lot of times you're working alone in your studio, yep. mixing and working on tracks and things. Yep. How does that fit in? Yeah, when I'm working alone, it's really cool because the council, again, is my whole, it's the center of everything I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that I come up with an idea, a sound that I want to have. And the council will allow me to get any of that. I have this council set up right now where I have a drum mix coming. And I'm using, I said, okay, I, I like that, that's cool, but I want a crush bus, right? A drum crush bus. Well, I can easily take these small faders, which I've done on this section, session, and send them up through buses that I can patch to other gear and then bring that back on small faders, not interrupting these, to be able to dial in my crush bus, right? So I know that might be a lot of stuff for, for some people, but the point is, is I can do anything I want. You know, sometimes I'll use a small fader out through a bus just mm -hmm. to send a delay where I have it muted most of the time. And I'll pop a delay in at the end of a phrase or something like that. It's easy for me to see. It's easy for me to get to, and that, that's the big thing. Right. Right? It, it brings you back to, I always think about it as, you mentioned the, the console as an instrument. Absolutely. And dating back, yeah. a, a mix was a performance. Oh, a absolutely. And, and still with the major mixers that we have today that are out there, the, the mix engineers who are, who are yeah. doing the, the big hits and things, they're still performing. When they're, when they're on a console like this. Absolutely. Whether, you know, it's in the studio or even live, like, that's, that's what I love. That's what brought me to this, right? It's the marriage of, of technical and science with the art of it, right? I, I went to school for jazz performance. I still have that love of performing, and I can do it on a council. Right. Right, I really can. And once you get into it and your mind is there, this is what I like. I don't want to go to a mouse and pull menus and all this stuff and insert this plug in, I can just work on this desk. Right, right. and you can still do all of that. Absolutely. You still have Pro Tools on your screen here uh, yep. in this case, and uh, you still have access to all of that. Absolutely, the hybrid thing is what it's, where it's at. Right, so the second aspect, I mentioned there were two aspects of this in, in my mind. One is that workflow and, of course, the performance that we just talked about. Then there's the sound quality issue. Absolutely. Talk about that a little bit. So there's a couple things. One is that, especially in a council like this, the, the preamps, are a big deal, right? You work on a Neve or you work on an SSL or you work on an Audient, with, this came from the guy that developed DDA and all that stuff. The preamp section is huge. You had a lot of people saying, well, I'm gonna cut on a Neve and I'm gonna mix on an SSL because all the boards have different sounds and different things that they will give you in that performance, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the bigger thing nowadays is summing, right? Everyone's buying summing boxes and things like that. Well, this is the ultimate summing box. And, you know, we can get as deep as you want, but we're pulling a Pro Tools session out on individual tracks. And the big deal is when they all sum in in that funnel, and you got to get down to two tracks, right? Right? How do you do that? In the headroom in a council, right? The room that you have to push a council to its point where it sounds the best is so far above what you can do in the box. I mean, there's great mixers that do great in the box work. Right. Um, I love the way a different council sounds, how I can push the input of a council and get that council to really start to sing and give me the sound it was designed for. Right. I've also heard that with many of the preamps we now use today, they were originally in, in uh, consoles Absolutely. like this, and they were actually designed to work in that context yes. with the way the rails are set up and yep. with the way the summing is set up and with the way the whole signal path is, is set up. And so having them actually in the large format like this makes a difference. Oh yeah, it, it makes a difference. And I love a bunch of outboard gear, right? What's great is you get a console that sounds the way you want it to, right? And then you've got your, your outboard gear that you can integrate into it that mm -hmm. says, oh man, I really want this API preamp for this sound, right? Right. This guitar has to have an API preamp or, or I have to have this, you know, vintage Neve sound or a anything like that. That's where you start incorporating outboard gear into your console and now you've got amazing flexibility. Right. It also, as the centerpiece, you never have to worry about latency, you never have to worry <laughs> yeah. about any of those kind of mechanical concerns Absolutely. that we do have to deal with in the box. And Absolutely. Of course there are ways to deal with it yep. as computers have gotten faster, it's become less of an issue, yep. but it, you really don't even have to think about it. No, and that's the great part. Like I just explained about the crush bus, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm taking my mix of my drums and I'm taking another set of faders that I'm pushing to a bus and coming out of a bus 
into some compressors that are analog and then right back into that and back into the console, right? So at any point, I don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, my crush bus is coming back seven or eight milliseconds later and it's all phased out and who said these crush buses sound good? It sounds horrible. Well, <laughs> it's, it's because of that, right? And right. I come back to this and it's all about phase, like getting everything in phase and not having to worry about that stuff really allows me to think on the artistic side of what do I want that sound to be. This allows me not to have to think about any of that. There are several other aspects to it too that, uh, that come to mind for me. One is just the visual aspect. You know, there's a, that's a big, big thing, right? So I managed a lot of studios in Los Angeles and some big studios that had Trident Dianes in one room and, and Trident ADC in another room and an EVR in another room. It came to the point when I was managing these studios that I would go to the owner and go, man, these guys are coming in using two channels <laughs> and the rest of the console is not getting used anymore because of the way people are working. Let's get it. Let's get rid of it. Let's sell it and let's buy a bunch of outboard gear. And he just, you're out of your mind. <laughs> Why? Because it is a centerpiece. Whether they're using two channels to come in here or not, when the A&R guy comes in, when the record company comes in, when your client comes in as an artist, there's something to be said about having a centerpiece to the council. And so for a commercial studio, that's very important. Yeah. Maybe less so for a home or a project studio Absolutely. person. But the other visual aspect is just seeing your mix laid out. Well, that's a huge time. thing. And that's, again, the flexibility of the council. So I may be using during tracking, my small faders may be all at unity gain, and that's my preamp to where I'm bussing out for independent channels. If I'm doing a single instrument overdubs, guitars and vocals and all this stuff, which is the majority of the project, I'll turn my small faders into my headphone mix. Instead of it being on a rotary pot, I'll have it on, a, on the small faders. It's easy for me to visualize when, a, when an artist says, hey, you know, I just, something's bugging me. I can visually look at those faders, right? And, and have my mix and their mix on faders and quickly be able to get them what they need. Right. So yeah, again, how you use the council at every step changes, but it's very valid on, on making that workflow and making all this technology disappear for the artist. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you can just see the way your EQ is set. You can just absolutely. see how your oxens are set. You can just see mutes yeah, and pans and everything's all, you don't have to scroll. Yep. All your channels are right in front of you. So that, that visual feedback makes working so much faster and, and so much easier. Um, I think that's really an important uh, facet of a, of a large console like this. Now we've talked about tracking bands and uh, you've talked about doing some overdubbing and we talked a little bit about how you use this for mixing. What about someone who's doing EDM. Someone well, who's a synth artist. That's, a... that's really cool. So I've set up a bunch of my customers that say, hey, you know, I got all these synths and all this outboard gear and all this stuff, and I'm sick of the way I'm trying to patch it all around, and I spend more time figuring out how to get it all to work right than I do creating. And that's horrible, right? right. So in that exact instance, I may set up a guy like that with all of his keyboards coming back to the small faders which are feeding buses that go to record. And then in Pro Tools now, because it's not just a tape machine, right? We can label in our IO setup so a guy can say, oh, my profit, I want a profit. Bang, it's there, it's here on the console, it shows up in Pro Tools. I want my old JV2080, right, or 108. I can pull everything up and every one of his synths is up at the console and ready to go whenever, again, the focus is the artistic idea of what you want to do and being able to make that happen quickly and, and not think about it. Right. Yeah, the whole idea of having everything connected and mm -hmm. always ready to go is, is very powerful and, like you said, such a time saver. For me, I want my studio to be hit the power switch and, Absolutely. and I'm recording or mixing or editing Absolutely. Or, or whatever, writing so music. A guy like that can have all his synths on his small faders, but now his large faders are what he's recorded and the way he's manipulated it to come back for the recording. Mm -hmm. So again, that inline design to let you do different things on the same channels. Is, and in this council, actually, what's cool is you can set the EQ, you can divide it into two to say, hey, I want these two bands to go to my large fader and these bands to go to my small fader. And you can mix and match that. That's, again, it's just complete control of what, what sound you hear in your head. You can get there fast. Right, that's that versatility and yeah. routing capability things. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to address with you, you step in front of a large console like this, and just to be honest, it can be intimidating. Yeah. you got a lot going well, on here. Well, sort of. Right? Sort of. And in all the, we pull into a big room, you walk into Capitol and you got this giant knee VR and everyone's like, oh my gosh, how could you possibly do that? Understand that 
every one of these channels works the exact same way. Right. So once you know one of them, and then once you understand how it all works together for your workflow, man, it's, uh, it's muscle memory at that point. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the same as I, I jump in my wife's car and I can't figure out how to turn it on, where the windshield wipers are. <laughs> I, I can barely back out of the driveway. But when I sit in front of this, after just a small amount of time, it all becomes muscle memory. Again, I want to think of what I want to do and hear a sound and be able to just go to it without having to think about what I need to do. Right. That's right. to me is what a console is all about. Right. So if we can summarize ergonomics, workflow, yep. flexibility, yeah. routing, sound quality, yeah. all these are aspects that, as you've said, free you up to be a creator. Absolutely. Whether you're tracking, whether you're mixing, whether you're writing, whatever yeah. you're doing, the console really does facilitate that for any level of studio. I think sometimes we see a board like this and we think, that's only for a commercial room, but right. it, it, home, home studio owners, project studio owners. Almost even more, Yeah. right? Because you're not, some of those guys, right? They got other gigs, they got other things they're doing. They don't want to have to rethink how everything's set up every time they get in their room because they may only have a few hours, right? Right. So once you've learned this and once you've got it set up how you want, which is what I do for people, right? And I help them to say, okay, just do this. And, and in a month, you're going to feel so free of the, you know, oh my gosh, this big console and all this gear. Forget about it. Now you're, right. you're creating. And even if you're, you're just an engineer, just an engineer, right? <laughs> you become part of that group that you're recording because it is a creative process at that point. It's not just a technical thing. Right. So that, that's my passion in doing this. <laughs> sure, sure. Rob, thanks so much for sitting down with us, taking us through why a console can be an important addition to any studio. Yeah. From home to, of course, the highest level of pro studios. Mm -hmm. This is a tool that can really make a difference in so many different ways. You know, I see it as an instrument. Mm -hmm. It is the instrument that I play when I'm working with these groups. Right. So Awesome. Well, yeah. Thanks again. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Mitch. You bet. Nice to see you. And thank you for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this look at how a mixing console can really make a difference to your workflow and your creative process. If you have questions about mixing consoles or you want to explore the options that might work well for your recording studio, give your Sweetwater sales engineer a call. They'll be happy to discuss it with you. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.